Indeed, all praises belong to Allah and Allah alone. We praise Him, we seek His assistance, and we beg for His forgiveness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the evil of our own selves and the evil of our sins. And whomsoever Allah wishes to guide, none can misguide Him from the straight path. And whomsoever Allah leads astray, none can guide Him to the straight path. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and final messenger. Ya ayuhal ladhina amunu taqullah haqqad uqadih wa la tamutunna illa wa anta muslimun. O you who believe, fear Allah the way he is supposed to be feared and do not die unless you are in a state of Islam. Ya ayuhal nasu taqu, ya ayuhal nasu taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa dhawjaha wa khalaqa minha dhawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa wa taqu allaha alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum rabiba. O mankind, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you from a single person and from him his wife and from them both he created many men and many women and fear Allah again through whom you demand your mutual rights and do not, do not break off your relations with your close relatives for verily Allah is ever watchful over you Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqallaha wa qulu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuti allahu wa rasulahu faqada fadha fawdan adhima O you who believe Keep your duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and always speak the truth. He will forgive you and guide you towards righteousness. And whosoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, it, indeed that is the greatest achievement that one can uh, achieve. Amma ba'd, as for what follows, Inna khayr al hadith kitab Allah wa khayr al hadith al hadith Muhammad al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa shara al umuri muhdatuha wa kulla muhdat al bid'ah wa kulla bid'at al dhalalah wa kulla dhalalah al finnah. As for, as for what follows, the best, the best book, the best speech available to us is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best of all guidance is the guidance of Muhammad, the one and only beautiful Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, every innovation, every new, in, new, newly invented matter is an error, is a misguidance, is a dhalala, is a, is a bid'ah. And every bid'ah leads to hellfire. Every misguidance leads to hellfire. With that, inshaAllah, I welcome all of you on this beautiful day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you and me with. With a beautiful, absolutely a beautiful uh, uh, ayat of the Quran, which inshaAllah I will only quote two and leave one for the last part of this, uh, for my class, inshaAllah. The, the ayat that I'm going to quote is of Surah al muminun right? The Surah itself is named after the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad aflah al muminun Indeed, Beishak, Qad refers to certainty, right? Indeed, the believers will be successful. Qad aflah al muminun the believers will be successful. Alladhi who, right? Those who, Alladhi hum fihi, fi salatihim khashi'un, 
those who pray the salat of khuju. So what is the meaning of the word khuju first? We need to understand that khuju has a lot of has a lot of meaning. I just can't tell you one English translation and say this is khuju. Khuju is humbleness in salah. Khuju is humility in salah. Khuju is concentration in salah. Khuju is understanding what you read in salah. Khuju is the fear of Allah in salah. Khuju is every aspect that brings you closer towards understanding the salah. This is khuju, right? We just can't say khuju is derived from the word khashia. Khashia means fear, and you should pray your salah with fearlessly. Fearless is just a very, very small word when you talk about khuju. Khuju is a very big aspect, right? I'll probably take two full hours only, talk, only to talk about the word khuju. So, I said, indeed the believers will be successful, those who pray their salah with khuju. And I, I believe this incomplete to end, inshallah, to end, uh, to end the section with my, uh, in the, towards the end of my class, inshallah. And I will tell you what success corresponds to in this ayat. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about success. Right? Inshallah, in our class today, we would not be doing two aspects. In fact, three. First, we would not be doing how to attain khuju itself. Second, we would not be doing the rewards and punishments that, that salah has. And third, we would not be doing the fifth aspects of salah. How to tie your hands, where to do takbir, how to place them. All this is not in today's class. Today is more than a lecture, inshallah, when we get into our sheets, we would actually deal with more as a, as a class that we can, you know, touch topic uh, uh, line by line and we go through everything, inshallah. So, in the question answer session, uh, I would like to stick to the topic, right? So, don't, I, I hope I don't get a question, can we read Surah Fatiha in the third rakat or no? Can we do this? That's all fit questions, let's leave the fit aspect to when we touch the fit aspects, inshallah. This class, however, will only, inshallah, focus on the understanding of Salah. And the understanding, not just what we read in Salah, but understanding how Salah plays two roles. The postures of Salah, how they correspond to our activities in our life. And why those postures in Salah. Right? So two things. One is the, why, why do we stand in Salah? Why do we bend in Salah? Why do we prostrate in Salah? Why do we sit in Salah? Right? And what do we do? How does that correspond to our life? That's how, inshallah, in today's class we will be focusing on. However, uh, Salah has four main aspects. Right? Before I come to that, let's understand the word Salah itself. Salah is derived, or rather, uh, comes from the word Salah. Salah means a connection. Right? And that's why when you stand for Salah, you are actually connecting yourself with your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's nobody in between. Absolutely nobody in between. However, Salah is broken into three parts. But even in those parts, you are connecting with only Allah and Allah alone. There is no other person that comes in between your Salah. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly shows that in your ibadah, nobody, nobody can come in between your ibadah between Allah and you. No wali, no peer, no awliya, no saint, no imam, nobody. You, you can't even, you can't even, to the extent that you can't even ask dua through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the Sahabas never did it. The Quran itself is, is a shouting example, right? Which shouts that this is wrong that we do. Whenever we ask dua in the sadqa of the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, it's so, it's absolutely, a, it's a bid'ah and it is something that is uh, wrong that we Muslim nation do it. However, Salah has four aspects, right? And these four aspects are not like, if you miss one of them, your Salah is complete. It's not like 25 marks out of 100. So 25 times 4 is, is, is 100. So if I miss one, I get 75 out of 100. Unfortunately, this is every aspect. If you miss one of these four, your entire Salah is invalid. So all these four have to be completed and it's necessary for the completion and validity of the Salah. <coughs> I'll write these four points in on the board so that this uh, it stays in your mind. 
it stays in your mind and you can always watch this because uh, inshallah in the course of time you will be running through these four points. The first the first I've just written concentration or slash understanding. Right? And the third is the manner of performing it. The manner of performing it. And the fourth. So inshallah, in the course of time, you will see all these four aspects, how they fit in our salah, as well as the awan. The first is, can you say that I would fit, I would pray salah with khuju, I would pray in the manner that is prescribed, and I would pray in, in on time, but I don't want to pray for Allah. Would your salah be accepted? Never. If you say, I'm going to pray for Allah, but I'm not even going to pay a minute, a second's attention to the salah. Right? I'm not even going to pay a second's attention in Salah. But I'm going to pray it in the manner it's prescribed and I'm going to pray it on time. Do you think your Salah is going to be valid? No. If you pray for Allah, you pray it with full understanding and concentration, but you perform it other than how it's prescribed and you pray it on time, do you think your Salah is going to be valid? No. If you pray Fajr at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, do you think your Salah is going to be valid? No. That's why all these four components fit in like a puzzle, right? And to fit, to make this puzzle, you know, to, to solve this puzzle, we need all four components. Without anything, your puzzle is never complete. So that's why it's, it's very, very important. When you stand, you need to see all these four things. You need to check all these four things. And if you look at Khuzhu, it's such an important aspect of Salah that it makes us, that how we need to live our life, even outside of Salah. Salah teaches us humbleness, Salah teaches us concentration, humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salah teaches us that every deed needs to be done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salah, Salah teaches us that the manner it has to be prayed. Salah teaches us there is a time for everything. Can you do Hajj in this month? Can you do, can you do Hajj in the month of Sha'ban? Can you do Hajj? The, one of the, uh, the biggest ibadats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best month of Ramadan. Can we do Hajj in Ramadan? No, we can't. Because there is a time prescribed for every single thing in Islam. And that's what Salah teaches us. Even outside of Salah, we need to be humble in our approach. In ibadah, even outside of ibadah. In, in outside of Salah, we need to take the manners of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And everything what he is prescribed. So, before I get into the next heading, I would just like to share a small, uh, a light note, right? There was a person who attended a khutbah, Jummah khutbah, and he goes home. He goes home and he calls out his wife, Ya Habibi, oh my beloved. And she comes and he carries his wife. He carries his wife for one hour, two hours, three hours, and he's carrying his wife. And the wife is surprised and she says, SubhanAllah, what a change my husband has got from this Jummah khutbah. So she asks uh, her husband, what, what happened? I mean, you, you're carrying me for such a long time. You've never done this. What happened? He says, I heard in my, I heard in the Jummah khutbah that Imam saying that on the day of judgment, Allah will test you by putting your burdens on you. So I'm trying to carry my burdens. Right? Right? Why did I get this joke? I want to link it, link it with something. Sisters, by the way, I'll share something to you just to cheer you up. Right? After my talk, the, the husband shouldn't go back and beat you saying that you're a burden to me. SubhanAllah, there's a beautiful hadith, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, the best gift, the best treasure of this life, of this world, is a virtuous wife. SubhanAllah, he didn't choose anything, but he chose a virtuous wife. So you are a gift to us, right? So, I'm coming to a gift, what is the burden? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night of Mi'raj, 
gave us a gift and not a burden. I want to say it again. We cannot treat our salah as a burden. It is a gift that Allah gave us and not a burden. What does Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa say in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari? He says, verily, the most burdensome salah, burdensome salah, for the hypocrites is salat al-Risha and salat al-Fajr. Why did he use the word burdensome? Because there is so much of I mean, laziness involved. They push it. You know, they, they feel it's so heavy on us. When you realize that salah is a gift, by Allah, our salah will change. When we understand what we do, the postures that we have in salah, our salah will change. We should treat it as a gift and not a burden. When the day, the moment you get up for fajr and you say, Ya Allah, again fajr, that's a burden. You haven't taken it a gift. Imagine you and I, just imagine you and I, if we get an opportunity or somebody is gifting something, say a, a crore or a 10 million as a gift, wouldn't you be, the, wouldn't we be the first in the line? Do you think that the money, the gift that he's getting is a burden on us? The, the one crore rupees, is it a burden or is it a gift? It's a gift. And by Allah, Salah is greater than that. By Allah, Salah is greater than that. Let's make Salah a joy in our life rather than a burden and let's change the value of Salah in our life. And by Allah, I would quote to you a beautiful, a beautiful verse of the Quran which 90% or even 100% of the men know this verse. Right? <laughs> This verse of the Quran is the most, absolutely the most powerful verse with regards to Salah. The most powerful verse with regards to Salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah al Surah number 29, ayah number 45. And I'll tell you why uh, at least 90% or 100% of men know this verse. Right? Allah, Allah says in the Quran, <coughs> <laughs> the verse that I want to quote to you is of, from Surah Al Ajdabut, Surah number 29, ayah number 45. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar, wala dhikr Allahi akbar. You know what all men do? They stand up. Why? Because the Jummah Qutbah is over. Subhanallah. We've never paid attention to this beautiful verse. We'll be waiting for this. Well, as soon as the Imam says, "Wara dhikr Allahi akbar," everybody just stands up. Ninety percent of the Ummah, ninety percent of men know that this verse. Whenever the Imam says this verse, okay, the Jumma Khutbah is done. Okay, I need to rush now. Right? Do you know that the Imam ends this the Khutbah with the most powerful verse of the entire Quran? The most powerful verse in the entire Quran with regards to Salah. Inshallah, I will tell you the meaning very soon. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, when I tell you the meaning, ponder, ponder over the meaning and say whether Salah has, is really has done this to my life or not. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells what Salah does in this verse, see for yourself. You are the best judge for your own self, for your own actions. You don't need anybody to judge you. By Allah, you don't need anybody to judge you. Allah has given so much of aqal to us that we ourselves are good judges. So let's analyze and see whether Salah really does this to, our, to us or no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse says, Inna Salati. Right? Inna Salata. Verily Salah. Beishak. Indeed Salah. Tanha. Abstains us. Protects us. Guards us. Stops us. Anil from what? Fahsha, the, the lusty evil desires that we have. The, the immorality, immorities, immorities that we have in us. That make us animal. That make us an animal. animal. Fahsha, anil uh, wal munkar. And all the munkar, munkar are those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. The disobedience, the, the mush, the shirk, the guf. Every single thing, the bid'ah, every single thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited and hates is munkar. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshari wal mudhar. Verily salah. Who is taking the promise? Not you, not me, not Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking a challenge. That salah stops you from this. Has salah really stopped us from this? That is the question that you need to ask. If no, then by Allah our salahs are not, not in order. Our salahs is not, are not in order. If yes, alhamdulillah, our salahs are in order. Are in order. If no, then we really need this class today. We really need this class today. If, us, if, if it hasn't stopped us from, from fahsha and, and from munga. So inshallah, make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases us in goodness and makes us, makes, under, makes us understand our salah and increase the khuju in our salah and accepts our salah, inshallah. Ameen. From today, inshallah, make a genuine promise that you will stop reading namaz. I just said, stop reading namaz. And everybody says, I thought five times namaz we need to pray, we need to read. I said, stop reading namaz. Let's start praying salah, inshallah. Because all we do is from memory. We just stand and read and read and read. Whether you give, whether that Arabic is changed into French or whether that Arabic is changed into German, we have no clue what we're reading. By Allah, we don't know what we're reading. We even don't know what the meaning of Subhana Rabbil Adin is. And we pray it how many times a day? We don't know what the meaning of Iyaka Na'budu, Iyaka Nasta'in, and we go on. How can we get khuju in our salah? And we don't know the meaning of these words. So inshallah, we have the sheets in our hands, right? Just give me another two minutes till we open that. And inshallah, since we don't have wadu in that, I would like to just point out one point of wadu, right? Wadu is such a beautiful topic that it will probably take me an hour and a half <coughs> to ask to actually touch every aspect of wadu, right? I'm not here to talk about wadu, but I'm only trying to talk about one point what wadu does. It is a part of salah because Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, there is no salah without wadu. There is no salah without wadu. So wadu is mandatory for salah, right? Today, inshallah, in our class, we will actually know from the sheets, and I've also, what we've done in the sheets, is I haven't printed back to back, right? So we, we've left a page for you to write down your notes, because if you have a notebook and you have the sheet, you would take, I would explain the sheet and you would write down the notes in your notebook, but you would never actually match them. Any time, after a year, or two years, or three years, you would always have the salah sheet with the notes within. Right, so it's good to write down the notes uh, while we explain uh, in the sheet so that it helps you uh, in the future, inshallah. <coughs> so inshallah, let's enjoy the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the night of the Miraj. The first aspect of Balu, apart from its rewards and what we need to do with Balu, Balu does something remarkable and it shows us what we need to do in our life. If I ask you a simple question, do we really need wadu for salah? Am I not clean enough from my business, drive up to the masjid, stand there with the, behind the imam? All I'm doing in wadu is just washing my, my hands, my forearms, my face, my legs. How dirty can they get? A question can be asked. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to explain that we need to be prepared for everything. And wudu is such an aspect of life that it prepares us for the best of ibadah, the salah, the best ibadah, the salah. Wudu is such a component that it actually tunes ourselves. We come out from, from this dunya, we take a break, we get into a mode that we are preparing ourselves for salah. Think again, why do we really need wudu? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is training us to be prepared for salah. And if you look at what wudu does, right, and, and how we need to be prepared, subhanAllah, if you look at this aspect, we need to be prepared for every single thing, be it the dunya or be it the, uh, for the akhirah. We need to be prepared. The first thing that Allah is teaching us, even before we enter salah, Allah is teaching us five times a day that we need to be prepared. 
whether be it for a business meeting, whether be it for a presentation, whether be it for examinations, be it even for a football match, we need to be prepared. If you are not prepared, we are bound to fail. And you know what man does when he fails? He makes excuses. So let's not make excuses, but let us be those Muslims who are prepared. SubhanAllah. If you look at your my age, the average age over here might be, okay, might be about 40. Right? If you had my age, you can reduce that. Right? It's about 40. Imagine the Sahabas at the age of 58, at the age of 60, at the age of 66, on the battlefield with a sword. SubhanAllah. Today, if you call somebody with a big fat stomach, what will they do? He won't even fight for 15 minutes. He says, brother, I need a smoke. I can't do that. Right? This is what we do. We are not prepared for anything. Absolutely. The first thing Salah teaches us to be prepared. So now, inshallah, let's get into the notes now. The first page. I've also added the Avan for a particular reason, and that is how Avan is also linked to these four aspects. How Avan is also linked to these four aspects and also a part of Salah, right? I'm not going to go through every word of, salah, of the Avan, I'm just going to pick a few words and try to explain. What's the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a messenger of Allah, the Avan was prescribed to the Muslims in Medina. You know, a lot of people came in, uh, to give uh, the bell or something like that, call of the adhyan, adhan. And then there, was this, there were two, three sahabas who got the same dream. And then Allah's Messenger selected that dream. And he says, this is the best thing. You know why? He could have selected the ringing of the bell. He could have selected anything, music, instruments, or clapping, or sounds, anything. All these things wouldn't make man more superior to animals. You know what's the thing that makes us more superior? Our beautiful voice. SubhanAllah, our intelligence. And Allah's message chose that. And the way he said it to Bilal. And the first thing that we do is Allah Akbar. The Mu'addin calls. The person who calls for the Allah. What does this mean? It means Allah is greatest. Allah is greatest at all times. But in specific, to the, to, with regard to Salah, it means something else. <coughs> It means that at that point of time, you are doing your halal business. You are doing everything that is halal. You have a shop that you're selling halal products. You are reading the Quran at that point of time. You are reading the tasbih. You are reading the hadith. Whatever you are doing, that's all great. But when the Mu'addin says, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than everything. You just testify yourself that Allah is greater than all my priorities at that point of time. What does Allah's messenger say? When the Mu'addin calls, you respond to it. It is, our, it is wajib that you respond to this call. And then Mu'addin says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. The first aspect of these four things. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship of Allah. What does that mean? Oh Allah, I am getting into Salah, and by Allah, this is only for you. It is only for you. It is just not, Allah has not made you testify five times a day. He doesn't want to confirm whether we are believers or hypocrites. It is you who are responding to this call saying that, Oh Allah, this is the call that I will be, I will be sincere in your path. I will be sincere in your path. And now what does the Mu'addin say? Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. You're just not testifying that he is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're just not testifying that he is the Messenger of Allah. You are telling that, oh Allah, I am, since I believe that he is the Messenger of Allah, since I believe that this man is Muhammad Rasulullah, I will follow his path of praying salah. I will follow his way of praying salah. I will follow every aspect that you have shown how to pray Salah. 
What does Allah's message, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 239? Pray as He has taught you. Pray as He has taught you how to pray Salah, that which you do not know. Who is He in this? Is it Imam Malik? Is it Imam Shafi? Is it Imam Abu Hanifa? Or is it Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal? Or is it your local Imam or my local Imam? No, the word He represents to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The greatest human being. This is what we need to testify. It's just not, I testify that he's the messenger, so no problem. I keep him there and I do what I want. The testification in the Adhan is for you to say that I will follow his way of praying Salah. And then Allah's, and then, and then the Mu'adhan says, Hayya ala al-falah. He says, Hayya ala al-falah. The fourth aspect, the time has come. Hayya ala al-salah, sorry. Hayya ala al-salah. The, the fourth aspect, the time for Salah has arrived. It's only when the Awan is pronounced, the time begins. So the fourth aspect is also mentioned in Salah, uh, in the uh, Awan. And then the Imam, and then the Mu'adhan says, Hayya al-Fala, come towards success, come towards success. I started my talk quoting to you Surah Al-Mu'minun. Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Indeed the believers will be successful. This is success. But I will also correspond to what success really means in this verse, inshallah, at the end of my talk. Salah brings two kinds of success. One success in this life and one success in the hereafter. And Allah's, Allah's Messenger sallam, guarantees that absolutely guarantees that in many many hadith and even the Quran guarantees that right Allah will increase Allah will increase life Allah will increase I mean, your goodness when you have when you pray Salah when you do good all your amal will be increased all your rewards will be increased you will have a very a, a pleasant life when you pray Salah when you have the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in you and then I've also mentioned two words in that which probably the ladies don't know that this is the words that are also always mentioned in the time of Fajr Awan. It's As-Salatu Khayrun Min al Verily, I hope the brothers know it. Verily, Salah is greater or better. It's Khayr, much, much, much better in reward than your sleep. and naum is sleep. Right? So Salah teaches us that Salah is better than sleep. And then we have the Iqama. In the Iqama, I would like to mention one point that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the word when he mentions Qadaqamat is salah, Qadaqamat is salah, it means the word Qadaqamat means the salah is about it's ready, stand up, it's ready, right? But also, it also comes from the word of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whenever he mentions about salah, he says, وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَةِ وَيُقِيمُونَ وَيُقِيمُونَ Pray it, pray it with firmness, with, with concentration, with a lot of meaning, it's understanding. So whenever the Imam, uh, the Mu'addin stands up before salah and says, بَدَ قَوْمَ الصَّلَةِ مِنْ يَقَوْمَ It means, now it's, for you, it's time for you to concentrate. Now it's the time for you to get in point number two, the khushu. Now you have to stand with humility, humbleness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for a reason I have got this dua. The dua after uh, Adhan. Only for a reason. And this is because 50% or probably more than 50% of the people of our ummah, unfortunately, very very unfortunately, believe that they will be there, there will be people who will save them from this on the day of judgment. And I would like to translate this dua as Allahumma Rabba Hazim al Da'a wa Salat al Qaima Ati Muhammad al Wasilata wa Al Fadilata wa Ba'atu Makam al Mahmud al Lazi Wa'ta. The only word that I want, to, I want you to focus, the only section that I want you to focus in this du entire dua is Ati Muhammad al Wasilah. Right? It is, oh Allah, you start with Allah, my Rabba, oh Allah, oh my Lord. You say, Ati Muhammad al-Wasila. Give Muhammad the right of intercession. 
Give Muhammad the right of intercession on the Day of Judgment. Give Muhammad the right of, of, of Wasila. What do we do? We find Wasila through our peers. We find Wasila through our awliyas. We, try, we find Wasila through our walis. We, find, we, we, find, we try to seek Wasila through the, through the graves. Na'uz billah. Everything is haram. Absolutely haram. There is no basis for this in Islam. You, after every salah, after every adhan, not salah, after every adhan, you are testifying, Oh Allah, give Muhammad the wasila, and you are finding somebody else. What kind of ulumma are we there? When you yourself say, Oh Allah, give Muhammad the right of intercession on the day of judgment. <coughs> By Allah, I'm telling you, if you think, that they will be apart from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who will have the right of intercession or who will save you and me on the day of judgment you will keep waiting and you will keep waiting and waiting on the day of judgment by Allah the train will never come I'm telling you it will never come because the Prophet Muhammad will take his people and will leave and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says in a beautiful hadith and absolutely why do I say the beautiful hadith? Because nobody can deny this hadith. You know this hadith is collected in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, in Imam Abu Dawood, this collection, in Trimadi's collection, in, Abu da uh, in uh, uh, Ibn Majah's collection, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi's uh, collection, al Nisa'i's collection, and so many collections. In fact, all the six books, the Qutb al sitta all these books have it. All these books have this hadith. And you know what Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says? The one who repeats the words after, after the Mu'addin, the one who repeats the words after the Mu'addin, or the one who prays this dua after the Awan, will have my intercession on the Day of Judgment for him. SubhanAllah. Allahu Akbar. You make a dua, O oh Allah grant Muhammad the wasila, and Prophet Muhammad is telling you pray this dua, you have my, my intercession. Do you need a better lawyer on the Day of Judgment to fight your case? SubhanAllah, no way. We need to think what we pray. We need to think what we read. This is how. This is why some understanding salah is really crucial. Let us change our beliefs. Let us change the belief that we have lived our life with. It is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam will come as an intercessor on the right, only upon the permission and the will of Allah subhanahu wa taala on the day of judgment. Like a beautiful, like a beautiful uh, hadith. Again, one of the most fascinating hadith. When you actually get into this hadith. In private, and when you when you're studying this hadith in private, I'm telling you, you will have tears in your eyes. Allah's Messenger says in Sahih al-Bukhari, all the prophets were given a dua. All the prophets were giving a were given a dua that Allah would never, never reject it. And He says every prophet prayed it for his ummah in this life. I have kept my dua for the uh, for the day of judgment for my ummah. Subhanallah. What a personality. What a man. What thoughts for us, for you and for me. And yet we commit shirk. We commit bid'az and we don't want to follow his sunnah. Nasrullah afiyah. I seek Allah's uh, forgiveness and protection against this, against this fitna. Now we come to things that we do before salah. Before we start the uh, salah. The first and foremost thing we do is four o'clock namaz for Tawm and Master Allah ke Mu'min Kudlaik Tarish Sharif ke Right? That's what we do, right? Don't be embarrassed. How many of us do that? SubhanAllah We just started our khutbah with Kullu Bid'at in Dalala wa Kullu Dalal fil Finna Every innovation is a bid'at and every bid'at leads to hellfire So you will ask Brother Intention is not there. I have prayed intention for 25 years. May Allah forgive and accept our salas. Intention is not there. Why? Because which language do you pray? Simple question. Which language do you pray your intention in? You say Urdu. Did the Prophet Islam pray in Urdu? No. If he had to make an intention, he would have made it in Arabic. If he had made it in Arabic, that Arabic would have been part of our sunnah. That Arabic would have been part of our hadith. But by Allah, in the 30,000 hadith that we have, or more, in Sahih hadith, there is not a single, forget Sahih, there is not a single hadith in the fabricated hadith, books of hadith, to show that the, the, the dunya is there for salah. 
It is just wudu. You stand and you say Allahu Akbar. You say Allahu Akbar. That's it. So verbal niyyah or any other niyyah is, is a bid'ah. So stop, inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you twice. You know, up to seven, seven, seven times or ten times. Based upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bids. When we stand, even before we say Allahu Akbar, we stand in the position that we stand is called Qiyam. Let's understand what this Qiyam does to us in our Salah and outside of the Salah. The first and foremost benefit of Qiyam, of standing, what does Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Stand in rows. He says stand in rows. It was so much so, so much so, that when somebody's feet were in front, Allah's Messenger would come with a sword, there are hadith that he would walk with a sword to put everybody back. And people were scared when Allah's Messenger would do something. Imagine you walk, the Imam is walking with a sword to check whether your rows are straight. SubhanAllah, what does this show? It only shows one thing that all men in the sight of Allah, everybody in the sight of Allah are equal. Just because you drive a better car than me, can you stand two steps in front? Just because I have a better, better bank balance than you, can I, step, can I stand four steps in front? Just because I am fair, can I, step five, can I stand five steps in front? <coughs> By Allah, nobody can do this. Whether the person is a truck driver or a bus driver or anything, be it the poorest of poor, when he is standing next to you, he is equal in the sight of Allah. It only, you are only raised by one thing and that is taqwa. You are only raised by one thing and that is taqwa of Allah. And if you have a problem with the person standing next to you, by Allah, check your iman. You have deficiency in your iman. Because Allah's Messenger has said, you have to stand in rows. Because it kills the creed of race. And it kills the creed of richness and poverty, everything. You have a problem with iman if you find your person, if you find the person next to you, if you, don't, if you dislike him. If you know he's your own driver, stand next to him. If you know he's the poorest man who sells something outside your house, you still need to stand next to him. That is the equality that Salah brings. SubhanAllah. That is what Salah teaches us. The first and foremost, just because I'm wearing the most branded shirt, what do I say? Wow. If a poor person comes and tries to even touch you, shake your hands. No. My hands will be dirty. Salah is teaching us something. And that is being equal in the sight of Allah. This is what we need to do. And always, Allah's Messenger, not always, but many, many times in, in hadith, it's, it's, it's proven in Sahih hadith, that the Messenger of Allah, before even starting his salah, he would say a beautiful, he would say a beautiful hadith. He would say, pray as if to say this is your last. SubhanAllah. Just imagine, if somebody, you, were, you just made wudu. While you're walking to the row, if somebody gives you an envelope, you stand there even before you say takbir, you open the envelope and say, Death is approaching you after you say salam. Allahu Akbar. What would your salah be? You would try to forget all the songs possible. You would try to get the salah, the best salah in your life. Why does Allah's Messenger say that? Pray as if to say, This is your last. Because death is something that nobody knows when it comes. SubhanAllah, again to increase your khuju in our salah. And then we say takbir tahrima. Right? The word tahrim comes to the word ihram. The word ihram comes to the word haram. It means prohibition. It means it's haram to do certain things. What, what does the word ihram do? When we tie our ihram, halal things become haram for us. Halal things become haram for us. And this is what again, Allah, when, Allah, when you say tahrim, takbir uh, tahrima, it, it means that there are certain things that which are halal become haram. Can we eat food in our salah? Can we chew gum in our salah? Can we drink water in our salah? Can we say salamu alaikum to my friends? Can we just sit down for some time? Can we just walk around? All these are halal things that Allah has put a prohibition. Taharima means a straight, uh, a, 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 a state of sacredness. You come into a state that you're in contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's haram to do these things. When you look at this, 
what, you, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to show is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits, there are so many things that are halal, He prohibits during salah. Ramadan, He prohibits food, the best of food, the best of biryanis are, are haram, haram for you during lunch. Right? The best of food is haram for you. Halal things are, are prohibited for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this point of salah is trying to prove to us, is trying to tell us when you stand in salah, when you stand in salah, you are not even permitted to do halal things, certain halal things. Imagine outside of salah how much we have to control ourselves of haram. SubhanAllah. How much we need to control ourselves from haram. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making us control ourselves from halal in salah, how much we need to control the haram things outside of salah. Now we come to the posture, the standing position and what it does. The first thing, subhanAllah, when a man stands, is it easy to push him? It's difficult. Rather than he's bend, when he's bending. When he bends, it's easy to push him. If a man stands, it's easy, it's difficult to even push him from behind. He's not going to fall so easily. What does it show? It shows firmness. It shows firmness. It shows, it shows stability. It shows firmness. In Qiyam, in Ruku, in Sujood, and when you sit down. When do you play the Quran? When do you read the Quran? You pray it only in Qiyam. Do you read the Quran in, in Sajda? Do you read the Quran in Ruku? Do you read the Quran in, 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 when you sit down? You don't. What is Allah trying to say? When the Quran is there, you be firm. Like the way you stand. This is what we need to understand. We don't read the Quran in, in Ruku. Whenever we read the Quran, we read it when we stand in Salah. Allah is trying to show that how firm we need to be in, in, when, when the Quran is mentioned. When, the, when it comes to the Quran. Then we stand not the way that we want to. We stand in a position the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to, wants us to stand. Can we stand in the way that we want to? We can't. We need to stand how Allah's Messenger has showed us the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes it. We stand. Can we walk freely? We can't. What does this show? It shows you are actually telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I can't move in salah. I can't go anywhere in salah. I have to stand in one position with my feet in salah. By Allah, when I have a, the ability outside of salah to walk, to go wherever I want, to do whatever I want, I need to, I need to protect my legs, I need to protect the way where I head in, in haram directions. When you stand in salah, facing, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we how can we head in a direction that is haram for us? What does Allah say in the Quran? Inna salata tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. How can we head in the direction of, of fahsha and, and, and munkar? We need to take control. Salah teaches us control. Furthermore, I want to add one point about the iqama and awan. There is a bid'ah, prevailing bid'ah, that the awan is pronounced to twice and the aqama is also pronounced twice. But the actual the hadith, the reality in the sunnah is the aqam the awan is pronounced twice and the aqama is pronounced once, except for qad aqama is salah. Right? I just wanted to get that point in, uh, in this talk. Next when we say Allahu Akbar in our salah. We just said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Allah, the Mu'addin reminded me that Allah was the greatest of all my priorities. When you stand there and say Allahu Akbar for the, in Salah, we just said, O oh Allah, I have made you the greatest as my priority. SubhanAllah. Allah could have said SubhanAllah and started the Salah. Allah could have said Alhamdulillah and started the Salah. But Allah made you realize that Allah is the greatest of all your priorities. 
However, inshallah, I would not go into the opening supplication because Allah's Messenger has prayed many, many supplications. It's difficult to touch all of them. But I have just given uh, the meaning and the Arabic text of what is most common of us Indians, right? So it's Subhanakallahumma wa bihan wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jaduka wa la ilaha ghayru. We can read the meaning and then inshallah we uh, go on to uh, Surah Fatiha. One thing that we really need to do in Salah is try to pay attention as much as you can. Because when you lose focus, Shaitan is always after you. When you lose focus, right? Sometimes we put our phone in the vibrator mode. Alhamdulillah, it's good. But it's still vibrating. And it focuses, it moves your focus. Who must have called? I was expecting a call. Man, I hope it wasn't the interview call. Right? It just changes your whole focus. If you can't switch it off, at least turn it on silent. Right? That's the best thing you can do for your own self, not for anybody else, not for the person praying next to you. In fact, if you keep it on, on ringtones, in fact, today's ringtone, subhanAllah, right? it suddenly plays and then you find an Amir Khan song and then you go into the movie. Which part of the song that came with the movie? And then suddenly the Imam said, goes to the Ruku and says, oh man, that was, that was I. Okay, it was the interview. Right? Allah Akbar. For you to really enjoy, we had a program in our, um, for the summer camp. You should take the CD. Uh, not because I'm going to make money on it, but just take a CD and uh, watch the the kids uh, perform the salah act. Right? It's I won't I won't tell you what it is, but it's truly an amazing act. You will actually laugh your guts out for next for at least four minutes. That's how uh, humorous that act was. Right? Take the CD and watch it sometime. Or you can in, in fact borrow it from the from the from here and then watch it and give it back again. Coming to. Uh, even before we start Surah Fatiha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam prays for help. Right? And what is that help? Say, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim." There are three identities here. However, inshallah, I would not get into the tafsir of Surah Fatiha completely. Uh, please, once we upload the lectures of the Quran program, please read. Uh, please go through the Surah Fatiha because we've done about seven hours only on Surah Fatiha. Seven hours only on Surah Fatiha. Please check the, uh, those le uh, video lectures and then you can you can get updated on Surah Fatiha. However, I will only touch about the main points in the section. And the first point that I want to mention is about Awadhu Billahi Min Shaitan Al Rajim. It has three different personalities. This ayat, this kalima has three different personalities. The first personality is you yourself. You say Alif A. Ah, that's me. And then you say Awadhu. I seek refuge. Billahi in Allah, the second personality. Ismun Jalala, Allah is Jalal. Right? So when, when somebody is asking help from somebody, when somebody is asking help, what do you say? The person asking help is weak, and the person whom you're asking help is strong. So you yourself are declaring that, oh Allah, I'm weak. I need help. A'udhu Billah, I need help. From what? Min shaytan from the shaitan who's always after me. Who's always after me. Right? This again shows something. Not just in salah. In every single thing we need to make dua first. We need to ask Allah's help first and then start with Bismillah. And then start in Allah's name. Every single aspect of our life. Even when, even probably when we enter our businesses or we start a tijara or anything, ask help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and start Begin, first pray to Allah for help and then ask Allah to help you. And then use uh, the uh, uh, Bismillah and then begin your business or tijara or anything that you have. Allah will give you definitely. Allah will really bless you inshaAllah. So the first thing that you say is I am weak, Allah you are strong and shaitan is my enemy. And then, where do we look? We look down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is training us and you, you and me, five times a day where we, where we need to look in our life. We need to look down always on the place of sajda, right in our salah. If we look, we generally have people watching and say, if the salah is too long, they look at the time. Ya Allah, Mawlana, Mawli Sahib, it's too long. Right? And the worst part is, they're actually praying and somebody's walking by and then you look and then, oh man, I look at it. 
right? And he knows you, right? This generally that happens. You're supposed to look down in the place of prostration. What does this teach you? It teaches a very beautiful lesson from the Quran. Allah says in Surah Nur, Surah number 24 and Ayah number 30 and Ayah number 31. First he tells about the believing men and then he tells about the believing women. In Ayah number 30 he says, tell the believing men to lower their gaze. Today unfortunately, astaghfirullah our lusty nature, our lusty eyesight scans women up and down. We want to scan the women today. When we walk into a mall, we scan everybody. Allah teaches us in the Quran, lower your gaze. And then he comes and tells in the ayah number 31, to the women, tell the believing women to lower their gaze. What does Salah do? It teaches us. SubhanAllah. Every posture is linked to our life. Allah's, Allah says, Allah's messenger says, don't look to the sky, don't look to the sky, Allah will snatch your eyesight. There's a hadith. Don't look too much, don't look to the sky, Allah will snatch your eyesight in Salah. So Allah is training here, Allah's message is training us that we need to look down. <clears throat> then we begin with Surah Fatiha. Allah's message sallallahu alayhi wa says in Hadith Al-Qudsi, Hadith Al-Qudsi is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself said something. It says a beautiful Hadith, right? This part of Salah, this part of the prayer, this part of Surah Fatiha is just a conversation between me, between Allah and my slave. I won't get too much in detail, I won't really want to get too much in detail, but I will only tell you that this is a conversation, direct conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and the slave, and me, and you. Right? We get an opportunity to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day. SubhanAllah. And when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, what are you trying to say? You're trying, Oh Allah, I'm your slave, you are my Rabb. My relationship with you is Rabb and slave is a master and slave. And a slave is supposed to do what the master commands. The slave has no choice. You're not a paid servant, you're a slave, remember that. There's a difference between a paid servant and a slave. A slave can never leave, a paid servant can leave. Right? You employ somebody, he can, he can walk out on you at any time. But you, but you enslave somebody, you can't walk out on anybody. Allah has enslaved you and me. The first thing you say is Alhamdulillah, you are Oh Allah, you are Allah. And then you say Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. And Allah loves this. Allah says, My, my slave has praised me. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Two words by Allah, two words that we really, really need in our life. Really need in our life. Excessive mercy and extensive mercy. A lot of translations say, Most gracious, most merciful. But that is a wrong translation. The true meaning of this verse is excessively merciful and extensively merciful. Allah is excessively merciful. Allah doesn't have limits to His mercy. And for us, you and me, Muslims, Alhamdulillah, Allah is always going to be merciful. Extensively merciful. We live for 65 years. We did ibadah for 65 years. If you actually see the time we done, we've done ibadah, you will probably take only 20% only of our life. 60 years we done, did ibadah. Out of only about 20 years are actually the physical ibadah that we did. 20 years, and look at the reward that Allah is giving in Jannah. Endless. Is that a match? Impossible. That is Rahim. Beyond the imagination for an extensive time. The limit is, is, is there's no, there's no yani, expiry date for His mercy. SubhanAllah. This is what we need every day. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my, my servant has, has exalted my, and he, my, my characters, right? Allah, in this, uh, when he says, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Allah says, I love this. I love my servant. He's praised me. And then he's, you say, Maliki Yawm al -Din. Again, Allah has specifically mentioned this in Surah Fatiha, is to remind you and me, every rakat, 17 times a day, you are telling your own self, you are not telling anybody, you are telling your own self that I am accountable for, for what my deeds are. I am accountable for my eyesight, I am accountable for my hands, my tongue, my legs, every part of my body I need to pay accounts to. Oh, what is a beautiful hadith that Allah's Messenger Salaam says, every morning, every morning, every part of your body asks one thing from your body to stay quiet. That is the tongue. 
Because it is you, O tongue, that will take me to Jannah or Jahannam. It is you, that is because of you I will burn. All the parts in the morning, this is a Sahih Hadith, Allah's Messenger says, all the parts of the morning, in the morning, tell the tongue to guard yourself. SubhanAllah. And the first phone call in the morning goes, Mom, you know what my mother-in-law did? We need to cut that call. I'm telling you, we need to cut that call. We need to fix relations ourselves. That's how Allah's Messenger says. What, what does Allah's Messenger say? What does Allah's Messenger say in every opening khutbah? Right? right? Before that, he says, do not break relations of your close relatives. Right? Very Allah is ever watchful over you. <coughs> then you might ask, why is Surah Fatiha in every rakat? Why not Surah Fatiha just once? Why is Surah Fatiha in every rakat? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again trying to focus on one point. That every rakat only shows you one thing. How consistent you need to be in ibadah. Rakat after rakat, rakat after rakat, you're praying Surah Fatiha. Can you say, out of four rakats of Bahar, I would only pray three times Surah Fatiha. The third rakat, I'll take a break. The Salah is in Galat. You need to be consistent outside of Salah. In, in the worship of Allah. You have to be consistent. Every aspect of life calls for consistency. This is what Salah teaches us. We need to be consistent. And then Allah's Messenger وسلم, says, Salah is broken into three parts. Salah has three parts. The first is for Allah. The second is for me. And the third is for yourself. SubhanAllah. This is one of the most beautiful hadith. You know why? Because Allah has given a place. Allah has given a time. Allah has given a period for us in our own salahs. For us. SubhanAllah. It is just not for Allah and His Messenger. Salah is even for you and for me. Allah has kept a place. Allah has kept the time that you can make your own dua. And this part is for Allah. Up until you sit for at tahiyat When you sit for the tahiyat it is for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The at tahiyat and the darud are for Allah's Messenger. Up until that is Allah's, Allah's section. Divided into three parts. The first is Allah's section. We are dealing with Allah's section right now. And we say Surah Fatiha brings us consistency in our ibadah. We need to be very, very consistent. Can we miss Fajr? We can't miss Fajr. We have to get up for Fajr every single day. We are enslaved. No matter what happens, no matter which movie we saw, no matter how long that was in the night, even if I come back at 3 o'clock in the morning, boom, I need to switch on that alarm and get up at 5. This is why you say, Rabbil Alameen. Allah is my Rabb, I'm here to do what you say. <coughs> Why guide me so many times? Why ihdinas sirat al-mustaqim? Ihdinas sirat al-mustaqim. Guide me, O Allah. Guide me, O Allah. Before that, inshallah, I will come to Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'im. Allah, like I said, this, this Surah Fatiha is divided into two parts. One is for Allah, one is for the slave. When you say, when you say uh, Maliki Yawm al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again becomes uh, very happy and He says, my, my slave, my servant has praised me, exalted me. And then you say, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. To you alone I worship and to you alone I ask you help. Then Allah responds, ask, this, this part, this section is for my slave. Ask whatever you want and you will be granted. And what you ask for, you ask for guidance. But I just want to get one point here. The word Iyaka na'bud is the center of this ayah of the surah. The center of the surah. It only shows us that Bud, Iya Kana'bud, to you we worship, is the center, center and integral part of our ibadah. The center of this deen is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else. Is to make is to make Allah free from all, all yani, shirk. That we have, whatever we associate. This, the middle part of the surah is what the, what the center of our deen should be. The motto of our life. That's what we say after every adhan. What do we conclude the adhan with? The motto of our life. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. And then we ask for ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Why so many times? Why do we ask for guidance so many times? So many times. 
We need, we need to be guided in our businesses. We need to be guided in our families. We need to be guided in the way we bring up children. We need to be guided in the way we take care of our parents. We need to be guided in, in the food we eat. We need to be guided in, in, the, in the way we drive. In every single thing we need guidance. But Allah, guidance is an integral part of our deen, of our life. Without guidance, we are nothing. Every single time we ask for guidance. And then he says, Today when you look at the top 10 richest men, richest people in the life, in, in the world, what do we say? I want to study their life because I want to know where they invested. I want to see how they make money. So that even I can make money. The same way Allah, Allah, is, Allah is telling us in this, in this ayat, in the surah, in salah, when we say Sirat al uh, Sirat al on, on those, the guidance on those whom we bestowed on, the successful people, Right? We should know the lives of the people who were successful in Islam. And that is the, the Messenger of Allah and His companions. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to know them. And then, أَنَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ And then, those people who earn Allah's anger. Right? Whenever we find people from going, from, you know, from, uh, from making a lot of money, so suddenly you see, after about 3-4 years, they are down to poverty. You say, what happened? What mistakes did you make? What back stocks did you invest in? You want to know what wrong they did. Why? To only protect yourself. What is Allah telling in the surah? Know what wrong they did. Don't, don't be like those who earned Allah's anger. Don't be like those who went astray. Know about them. Surah Fatiha teaches us, such a big lesson that we should know what is right in our life and we should know what is wrong in our life so that we can choose what we need to do, our priorities in life. And then we, we, say, we finish Surah Fatiha and then we take another part of the Surah. We take another part of the Quran. Whatever, whatever section it is. Why don't, have you ever realized, why didn't Allah's Messenger or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we start, when we say Allahu Akbar, and we say, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, An Umar radiallahu anhu qal, innama al-amalu bin niyat. Have you ever said that in your salah? No, because that is the hadith. Do you breathe hadith in your salah? No. Why? Because the Quran, when you read the Quran after Surah Fatiha, what are you asking? What are you asking Allah in Surah Fatiha to guide me? And you know what the Quran is? It's a book of guidance. The Quran tells you what to do. The Quran is what to do. When you come out of Salah, you have learned in the Quran. For example, if the Imam prays Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 235, Riba, interest is haram. If he does this in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in his uh, Surah, now the Quran says interest is haram, but how it's haram, why it's haram, what type of business is haram, all that you find in the hadith, in the sunnah. So now you go outside of the salah and you find these things. The Quran is what to do, the sunnah is how to do. You don't pray how to do in your salah, you pray what to do in your salah, because you're asking for guidance. Oh Allah, I'm asking for you to, for, to guide me, tell me what I need to do. That's the thing you, you will ask me, oh Allah, tell me what I need to do. And Allah's message tells you how to do it. SubhanAllah. That was the most interesting part, subhanAllah. I love this section, the ruku and the sujood. As soon as I said I love this section, let me put it up. Sometimes, we get bored of doing things in a monotonous way. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you 20 minutes of just standing and reciting the Quran, we would get bored. We need change sometimes. It brings us focus. It helps us to come back into what we are. And before going to Ruku, what do we say? Allahu Akbar. We say Allahu Akbar. Again, reminding us, if I have done anything wrong, if I had remembered anything about my business, or about my family, or about anything, 
I just have said, Oh Allah, you are again great. You are the greatest and you go into the forum. We just cannot make our, our businesses, our thoughts, our family or anything greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Allah gives a time for everything. Outside salah, you do what you want. You make whatever priorities you want, but don't remember, don't forget me. Do whatever you want. But in salah, I'm your first priority and highest priority. And the only priority. There's nothing else. So now you say Allahu Akbar and you go to the home. The word rakat comes from the word ruku, and that's why we say one rakat, two rakats, and three rakats. And Allah's messenger says, whoever catches, whoever catches the ruku catches the rakat, right? And that's why the ruku is very, very important for you to know whether you've missed your salah or you have not missed your salah, or you have not missed your rakat, right? Because if you catch your ruku, you've you've caught up your you've caught up with your rakat. So now when you go into ruku. You say Subhana Rabbi al The word Subhan, the word Rabbi, and the word Adi. There are three words here. And the word Subhan is also a similar pattern of Rahman. The word An and the Rahman have the same thing. What is the meaning of the word An in Rahman? Excessiveness. Right? Rahim is extensively. When you say Raham, is mercy. When you say Rahman, it's excessive. When you say Rahim, it is extensive. It is time bomb. So when you say Subh, you say an An, you add excessive to it. So now what is the true literal meaning of Subhan? Most, 99% of the translations say glorified be Allah. Right? Again, glorified is also one of the meanings, but it really does not fit the word Subhan. Because you really can't translate Arabic into one word and say this is the translation of the word Subhan. Because this is one of the qualities of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. <coughs> the word Subhan comes from the root word Sabaha. Sabaha means something that floats on a very high position, something that does not come down, something that floats and constantly. And when you say An to Subhan. What do you say? What do you mean? You say Allah is so excessively high, so high that he, does, he, he cannot come down. He doesn't come down. No matter what you do, Allah doesn't come down. Now I'm asking you a question. When a, when a man stands, when a person stands, isn't that the most best position, the most highest position that he can get to? Right? Standing, bending, sitting down. The most and his stable position is standing. The most superior position is standing. That's why when people enter the room, and he, when, when the judge enters, what do you do? Everybody stands up, right? To show him that he is superior. So standing up is a position of being superior. So subh, subhan is where you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so superior, so high that he doesn't come down. What do you do when you say Subhan? You bend. SubhanAllah. You're testifying that, Oh Allah, you can't bend, but I bend. Allahu Akbar. What's a, what a beautiful thing this is. When you say Subhan Rabbi al you tell yourself that Allah is the one that who cannot never bend. It is I who bend. So, and you say, Subhan Rabbi, and to, you say, I bend to my Lord, Rabbi is my Lord. You say, I'm bending to my Lord. <clears throat> and <coughs> Azim comes from the word Azim, which means bone. Right? Imagine you take the bone from, from your wrist to your elbow. Can you bend it? What does the bones show? It bone, it, the bone shows strength. Right? What do generally the kids say? I'll break your bones. Right? To show how powerful, to show how strong I am. And the most common thing, I'll break your bones. And sisters probably you haven't heard this, but it's very, very common here. The first thing that we do when you, when you, have, when you come out of uh, you know, school or something like that, that's what we do. So the bone shows stability, the bone shows firmness, the bone shows strength. 
right? And you say, Subhan Rabbi al -Azim. And you go down, saying that, Oh Allah, I don't have strength. I'm not stable. I have just gone to a position that is firm to unstable. You're being very, very unstable. Anybody can push you off when you, when you are in a state of ruku. But when you stand, it's difficult to push you. But when you're in ruku, anybody can push you off. They just tap you and then bang, you go down. Right? But you are testifying Allah that He can't bend. And then you stand up. You say, Sami Allah, Badi Man Hamida. Sami'a means to hear. It's a verb to hear. And you say, Sami Allah, Allah hears. Allah is listening, Allah hears. But the word Hamida is mentioned and not Alhamd. In Surah Fatiha, we say Alhamdulillah. All praises belong to Allah. But here we mention the word Hamida. In Surah Fatiha, the word Hamdun is a noun. But here is a verb, SubhanAllah. A verb is only present. Right? So you are telling now, Oh Allah, Allah listens to the one who calls upon him. SubhanAllah. Right? And you're praising him. And now you're going to a position that you're actually closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The closest to Allah is when you're in sujood. And what do you say just before that? Allah hears those who call upon him. And you go into sujood. You're actually trying to, you know, convince yourself. You're actually telling Allah, Oh Allah, it's just a reminder, you hear me. I'm coming down now. Right? SubhanAllah. Sami Allah, but even Hamid, Allah hears those who call upon him. And you're praising Allah for that. Hamidah is you praised at that point of time. Then, I've also given a beautiful dua that Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, approved. Uh, he says, Rabbana wa laikal hamd, that's the general thing. But then you can also have, add a lot of other duas. Alhamdulillah, al And also, Allah uh, there, there are many, many duas. Right? You can also add them. You can take the covers of the Muslim and add these things to make your salah more beautiful and longer. Because Allah's Messenger says, the one who prays salah long, and gives the Jum'ah khutbah short is the person who has knowledge. Right? SubhanAllah. Today we find the other way around. We have long khutbahs in Jum'ah. Very, very long Jum'ah khutbahs. But the Salah is like three minutes. Right? And Allah's Messenger says that's a person who doesn't have knowledge. A person who has knowledge has short khutbahs and long Salahs. SubhanAllah. However, I put this point. There's a beautiful hadith that Allah's Messenger says that when he, when he said Sami Allah wa Hamida, there was a person who said, Rabbana wa rekal hamd. Hamdan kafiran ta'idan mubarakan fi. And Allah's Messenger says, I saw 30 angels racing towards you to write it down. SubhanAllah, that's a great reward. And then you say, Allahu Akbar. And then now you go down. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, That is sujood, sajda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves sajda. Absolutely loves sajda. And sajda teaches us something in salah. And that is, we cannot, absolutely cannot bow down to anybody else apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't even bow down to our parents, to our peers, to our buddies, to our awliya, to the grave that we, that we always keep visiting. Forget all these people. We can't even bow down to our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is haram. It is only and only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can bow down to. And then, what do we say when we bow down? We say again, subhan rabbiya. We say, oh Allah, you are, you, are, you are in a position that can never come down. What did we say in ruku? We said azim. But what do we say in, in sajda? We say ala. Ala means the highest. You are just now declaring that Allah is in the highest position. That you did not do it in, in ruku. You are doing it in sajda. While you are in the lowest of low. Absolutely the lowest of low. If your feet are on the ground, if your hands are on the ground, if your stomach is on the ground, or your face is on the ground, which is the worst thing? The face being on the ground. It's humiliation. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now making you realize what you are, what we are, and what He is. It's not subhana rabbi ala in ruku. It's not subhana rabbi al in in, uh, in, in raka'ah, in, in sajda. When you were stable, 
You just said, Allah, you are stable and I'm not. And you bend it down. Now you said, Allah is ala, the highest. And now you are in the lowest in position. SubhanAllah. And then when you sit down, when you sit in between, it's a rest. Resting period. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He rested in this point. It shows us something. How much to rest? Where to rest? Can we pray Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawmuddin and stop for some time? We can't. We can't stop wherever we want to. This is where Allah's Messenger rested. Where to rest? We need to have the, the right position to rest. Outside of Salah, you need to rest in your bed, not in your neighbor's. We need to think about this. How much to rest? You need to rest from Isha to Fajr. You can't rest from Isha to Dhuhr. Right? Today, Alhamdulillah, if you take the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and see what Allah's Messenger says, if you can't do anything constructive after Isha, go to bed. If you don't have anything constructive after Isha, go to bed. Today, 90%, 90% of the sins are committed after Salat of Isha. 90% of the sins are committed after Salat of Isha. If you look at the, if you look at the youth today, they come back drunk at four when the Muslim goes to the masjid at four or five. SubhanAllah, from pubs and this, astaghfirullah alim. May Allah protect us all from this, from this fitna. 90% of the sins are committed in the night. And Allah's messenger says, stay at home. That's the best thing you can do, SubhanAllah. You don't have anything constructive, go to sleep. Rest. Can you rest for 12 hours? Can you rest for 14 hours? No, you can't. It's, Salah shows us how much to rest between two sastas. How much to rest? The quantity is mentioned. From Isha to Fajr, that's it. You have to get up. Fajr is not Sunnah. Fajr is not Nawafi. It is for, it is Wajib. You have to get up. And then, Allah's Messenger said, in this rest, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you, whenever you rest, remember Allah. What does Surah Al Imran say? The, the mu'min, the true believers, remember Allah when they stand, remember Allah when they sit, remember Allah when they lie down, remember Allah when they take rest, everything. Allah's Messenger rested. And look at the position of this beautiful dua. You have just gone to the lowest of low of your life. You have just gone to the to Sajda, the lowest of low. Showing Allah that I'm dirt. You come back and you say, Allahumma firli, warhamni, wahdini. وَرْزُقْنِي وَجْبُرْنِي وَعَافِنِي وَرْفَعَنِي Right? اللهم اغفر لي وارحمني 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 What do you say Allah? The first, O Allah forgive me. Just, O Allah have mercy on me. O Allah guide me. O Allah support me. O Allah provide for me. O Allah elevate me. You are just showing yourself that you have come from the lowest of low and you are telling Allah how dependent I am on Allah. <coughs> if you take the seven dua, seven things, forgiveness, guidance, protection, mercy, sustenance, oh Allah feed me, you're asking what is okna, grant me rest. Today we find so many people saying that I'm a self-made man. Nasrullah <coughs> Afia. Right? Allah says, you are asking Allah, oh Allah, I need, I need rizq from you. What does Allah say? Allah, Samad, oh Allah, I depend on you. Everything depends on you. Allah is Samad, everything depends on Allah. You are just showing how, how, how dependent you are for, for Allah, for Allah's mercy, for Allah's sustenance, for Allah's barqa, for Allah's protection. And then you go back again. And then when you sit down for tashahud, this is where Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, section begins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala section ends and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam section begins. And what do you say? You say, At-Tahiyyat wa lillahi wa salawati. Right? At-Tahiyyat, it comes from the word, uh, it's like a ta'aruf, it's like an introduction. And it's also an introduction that, that has full of compliments. However, in our Sharia it is haram. When, a, when the judge walks in, what, what does everybody say? <coughs> your majesty, your highness, your royal, whatever you say. The queen walks in, right? 
This is haram in our religion. But what we, what we say to Allah is at tahiyat Because all compliments belong to the, to the Most High. Right? These are compliments that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you know, you introduce somebody with compliments. This is how you, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to uh, we, we compliment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all His praises. And then you say, Atahiyatul Ibrahim. All, all compliments and places belong to Allah. Was salawat. Salah and salawat. Salah is singular and salah, salawat is plural. And all the salawat, all the blessings belong to Allah. And you say, What ta'ibat? Ta'ib means everything that is pure and clean and that is good. Everything that is beautiful is belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what do you say? Assalamu alaika. Say and may peace be upon you. Ka is you. Kum is all of you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say here kum. He says ka. On whom? Ayyuhan nabiyu. On mine, your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa On our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa So this is what Allah's message says. This is my part. Right? Again, this shows us a beautiful thing. I've mentioned that hadith in, in, in your notes. How we need to make dua, even our personal dua. There was a person who came to the masjid of the Prophet and he just started making dua. And the Prophet said, this man is prayed in hard, by being in a very hurry position, I mean in a situation. He's very, very hurry in his dua. He hurried in his dua. So he called that man and he said, why didn't you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why didn't you send salawat? Why didn't you send the rood on me? And then ask for what you want. Salah teaches us how to, how to make us do, how to make dua outside of salah. Salah starts with praises of Allah, Salah starts with Darud and Atahiyat for, uh, for Allah and then uh, uh, peace on Allah's Messenger and then Salah starts with Dua for our own selves. Right? This is how we need to get. We, we say Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah or whatever we are. We, we have a problem, don't just lift your hands and say, Oh Allah, do this, Oh Allah, I need this, Oh Allah. Say Subhanallah, say Alhamdulillah, praise Allah first. Say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad first, second, and then make your own dua and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts these duas. We complain, we complain that Allah is not accepting our duas. Imagine in a position that Allah had to punish us for our sins. After every sin, Allah sends a punishment. After every sin, Allah sends a punishment. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't punish us that way. And yet, we complain that if our duas are not accepted. SubhanAllah, have patience, brothers and sisters. Allah knows when to accept or reject your dua. Allah knows when to give what to whom He wants. And then you say, Assalamu alaikum, ayyuhan nabiyu rahmatullah. Right? A lot of people, astaghfirullah uh, the Sufi sect, right, add the word ya there, which is absolutely haram. It says, at tahiyatu lillahi wa sallam. It says, Assalamu alaikum, ya ayyuhan nabiyu rahmatullah. Right? Is, if you add Ya, you're actually making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a person who has, and who is in front of you, a person who is, they say he's Hazar Nazar, astaghfirullah right? Who is everywhere, right? If you say Allah's Messenger is right here, right? Listening to us, na'uz billah, this is shirk, this is haram, this is not allowed, right? So do not add anything what Allah's Messenger has given to us. It is, Abdullah ibn Masood says, it is more than sufficient. SubhanAllah. What Allah's Messenger has given to us, it is more than sufficient. And then, what do you ask for? To the Messenger of Allah. What do you ask for, to, for, for the Messenger of Allah? You ask, wa rahmatullah. Allah's rahmat on him. And then you ask, wa, wa barakatuhu. And you ask, Allah's barakat on him. And then you ask, what a beautiful section this is. And so many brothers come and say, brother, please make dua for us. Brothers, all you have to do is pray salah and everybody is making dua for you. You say, Assalamu alayna. Assalamu alayna. Say, Oh Allah, may peace and mercy be upon us. Alayna is two people, or, or us. And then you say, Wa ala. And all those people, Ba'dillahi salihin. And all those ibadahs who are, who are salihin, who are obedient to you. And all those people. Is it mentioned only in Bangalore? Is it mentioned only in India? Subhanallah. Whether you are in Australia, whether you are in India, whether you are in Pakistan, whether you are in America, whether you are in UK, whether you are in Sri Lanka, every Muslim brother, if you pray Salah, if you are obedient to Allah, if you are one of the Salihin, 
every single Muslim is praying for you and for me. And we, when we pray Salah, we are praying for them. SubhanAllah. This is how beautiful Salah is. And this is what Salah teaches us. We need to make dua for others. We need to make dua for others. And then you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then you testify that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah's Messenger is the primary messenger. So something here is when you, when you move your finger while you play Tashahu, and you move your finger, Allah's Messenger says, it is like it is, it is beating the shaitan with, with harder than with an iron rod. Right? Allah's Messenger says in Aksari Hadith, it is like beating the shaitan with harder than an iron rod. This aspect of Salah, this posture of Salah teaches us something. Even outside of Salah, we need to be as hard as an iron rod with the shaitan. SubhanAllah. We just can't give in to the shaitan. You know what shaitan does? SubhanAllah. You need to read the Quran. You need to understand the Quran in Arabic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Khutwat al-Shaitan, the footsteps of shaitan. If you go, right, if a beautiful girl calls you and says, she calls you for a night, she says, Astaghfirullah. Na'uz billah, haram, zina, I don't commit. If you just ask your cell phone number and say, SubhanAllah, I'll give you both mine. He says, I just want to stop for 15 minutes a day. We talk. Khutbah to shaitan, you now get into the first of shaitan. It's only talking, brother. I'm not doing haram, I'm not doing zina, it's only talking. Then she calls you for a coffee, you go. She calls you for a dinner, you go. She calls you for a movie, then you go. She calls you for the night, you end up going. That's khutbah to shaitan. Big things look really big for us. Small things look very small for us. That's the trap. That's the cheese in the mouse trap. You get the cheese, you're in. That's what Allah's Messenger teaches us. You have to be hard as the iron rod with the shaitan. What does Allah's Messenger say? Umar about Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Shaitan walks the opposite direction where Umar walks. Why? Because of his iman. SubhanAllah. He is Umar. We can't even be you of Umar. Right? We need to be. We need to be. Allah says, Kama amunu. Believe like the Sahabas. We need to have Iman like the Sahabas. And then Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes on to say about the Darud. <coughs> Darud. And Atayyat is one of the most important aspects of Salah. One should read it. Without that, your Salah is not incomplete. Your Salah is incomplete. And Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi says, Allahumma salli ala. Right? Oh Allah, send your blessings. Exalt your blessings. Send your blessings. To whom? You say, Allah, on Muhammad. I want you to pay attention to, to the words, Allah Muhammad and the word after that. Allah. Both are Allah. But one does not have the mud. You know what the mud is? You stretch, right? You know what the, where the mud comes? It comes from before the word Ali, right? It's so beautiful to know Arabic the way Subhanallah, Allah's Messenger has, has done it. You know, for example, if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, in the Quran he says in Surah Al-Baqarah, you know, enter into Islam, and the word He mentions, and Allah's Messenger says completely, like all of you enter into Islam completely. So Allah's Messenger, Allah says in the Quran, in the word is kafa. He puts the wrong mud. The word kaf is also enough. But he puts the word mud. Meaning, it's like telling, enter into Islam completely. It's the same thing. So here, you say, ala Muhammad. Because Muhammad is just one person. Al, the followers are many. So you say, ala all of them. SubhanAllah. Say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Oh Allah, bless, uh, send your blessings on Muhammad and all, on, on all the followers of Muhammad. Ala Ali Muhammad. SubhanAllah. Right? Just see what the mud does. And Ali refers to, a lot of people say only to the family of the Prophet Islam. But I'm sorry to say it's not the family of the Prophet Islam. It includes the family of the Prophet Islam. But it includes the followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is not mentioned. Ahliha Muhammad or Ahlal Muhammad, right? The, 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 the family of the Prophet. It is Al, it is means the meaning is followers of Prophet Muhammad. 
Kama sallaita ala Ibrahim. Like the way you have blessed Ibrahim. Why Ibrahim out of all the messengers? To show us one thing. That Ibrahim is associated with this Ummah. The deeds of Ibrahim are associated with this Ummah. Our entire Hajj is based upon Ibrahim and his family. The Sayyid that we do between Safa and Marwa. It's his wife and son. He goes to sacrifice his son in Arafat, uh, in Mina. That's Ibrahim alayhi salam. So it's, Ibrahim alayhi salam is so closely linked with our Salah, I mean, our, our Deen, right? So and that's why uh, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Ibrahim out of all the messengers. Of Allah, of all the messengers. Innaka Hamidu Majid, really Allah is most praised and, and glorious. Allah, Allahumma barik ala Muhammad, the same thing. The first thing you ask, is salah is basically the blessing. The, the second thing is you ask for barakat. Uh, the same thing, kama salaita ala kama baraka ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. And now this is your section, brothers and sisters. Subhanallah. This is your section. This is our section. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says in a beautiful hadith. It's a beautiful hadith. He says, this is your section. Pray as you wish. Subhanallah. Pray as you wish. However, there is a lot of ikhtilaf on this hadith. Pray as you wish. And from the four schools of thought, the, the Hanafi school of thought and the, and the uh, Ahmad bin Hanbal, Hanbali school of thought, say that you cannot ask for any worldly things. You have to pray the du'as and Allah's message of prayer. Imam Shafi and Imam Malik say that you can pray anything that you want. Another ikhtilaf comes whether you can pray in your own language or Arabic. Right? Sheikh al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah he says, if you don't know Arabic, then you pray in your own language. But learn Arabic to pray in Arabic. It's Musta'ab, it's much better. And a lot of scholars say that this is your section. How can, you, how can you leave it blank? How can you pray, pray things that you don't know? And there are, so, the, there are scholars of the Tabi'un and the Tabi Tabi'un, the, the early generation, who used to say, I used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in salah, even for my slippers. Subhanallah. <coughs> even for my slippers, I used to ask Allah in, 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 in my salah. Today, we finish salah in the Sukhofraq Express, and then we sit for 45 minutes in a congregation dua. We just probably did, did it three days back. Shalim Miraj. Right? Brothers and sisters, Salah is for us. Allah has put a part for, in, in Salah for us. Let us make whatever dua you want. There was a question to uh, one of the greatest scholars in our times, Sheikh uh, Utaymin. <coughs> Sheikh Utaymin. There was a question from a sister who said, Sheikh, can I ask for a man that I want to get married to in Salah? And the Sheikh said, yes. And he gave a detailed explanation. And he said, yes, there's no time for the detailed explanation. If anybody wants a detailed explanation, let me know or email them uh, that, that, portion, uh, that portion of the Sheikh's answer. Right? With all the references, inshallah. But as for now, the best opinion is that this is your section. And the hadith, the words of the hadith is this is for you, pray as you wish. What do you wish? What do you desire? But Allah, Allah, the, the scholars of Islam say, whenever you make a dua in your salah for yourself, let it be halal. Don't say, oh Allah, my brother got a car, I want his car. <laughs> right? It's a haram. You, you have to ask for halal things. Right? You have to ask for halal things. So this is your section. And I have listed a, a four, section, four duas in this section. It's a very, very beautiful dua and very, very commonly prayed by the Prophet ﷺ in Salah. The first is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatu wa fi al-akhirat hasanatu wa qni azab al-nar. It's an ayat of the Quran. It's a dua. You can pray any dua you want, right? However, I've chosen this because this deals with the dunya and the akhira. The second is, again, see, for example, Arabic was the language of the Prophet and the Sahabas, right? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh came to the Messenger of Allah and said, Ya Rasulullah, this is my section. Tell me something that I, I want to pray. So Allah's Messenger gave this to, to Abu Bakr. 
Allahu ma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathiru wa la yaghfiru zuluha. And he prayed on. Right? So this was Abu Bakr's dua. It was personal. Right? This is where we say you can make your personal duas but be, keep it halal. And the next is a very very beautiful dua to save you from Jahannam, uh, to save you from Jahannam and for Jannah. And the next dua is again uh, from the fitna of the Qabr, the fitna of Jahannam, the fitna of, of sins, the fitna of debt, of being into debt, everything, right? And to conclude, we would come to Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, right? When you turn your face to the right and the left, what is it you're doing? Aren't we saying salam to the angel that is present here, right? As far as we know that we, we make salam to the angel. But we just said in at tahiyat Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. The word ka is you. If there's an angel here, you should say Assalamu alayka wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right? But Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us Assalamu alaykum to all of you on the right side. Assalamu alaykum to all of you on the left side. Subhanallah. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows us, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in this, that we, when we end our salah, we end it with, we end our salah and we begin what? We begin our normal life. And what is the thing that breaks salah and our normal life? It's peace and mercy. Subhanallah. A true Muslim can never, can never harm an, an, any other person. A true Muslim is a Muslim that can never shed blood. A true Muslim is a Muslim who always, always strives for peace and, and harmony. Peace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can never be, we can never be antisocial elements. We can never cause harm for the society. This is what we learn in Salah. When we say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Every single time we are, we are praying for Salah. Every single time we are praying for others. In Salah. How can then we Muslims be so harmful? We can't. SubhanAllah. This is what Salah teaches us. And then to end, what do we say after Salah? We say Astaghfirullah three times. Or Allah Akbar Astaghfirullah three times. It shows us two things. This particular aspect. It shows us two things. You have just done the best of ibadah. Yes or no? And yet you have asked us for Allah three times. It shows us two things. One, it says, Oh Allah, forgive me for the mistakes that I've just committed in my deed. Because I'm not perfect. Forgive me for the mistakes that I've committed in my deed because I'm not perfect. Second, is Oh Allah, I don't know whether you'll accept or not. Forgive me and accept. SubhanAllah. Salah is so fascinating to understand. It is, and it's so important for us to understand that without understanding these words, we would never get khushu in our life. We would never fulfill the second aspect of salah. We would always, always have our salah on the edge of being invalid without khushu. Why, brothers and sisters? Let us not be in a position that our salahs will be thrown back on, the, on our face on the day of judgment. That's what Allah's Messenger says. A person will come with 60 years of salah. A person will come with 60 years of salah. And every salah will be thrown at his face. Nasrullahi afiyah. May Allah protect you and me from that day. With that, I would like to end my talk with the verse of the Quran that I quoted in the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun. He said, Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Verily, indeed, believers are successful. Alladhiyum fi salatihim khashirun. Those who pray salah with khushu. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the reward for this, what success is in this ayat, in this section? He says, those who do this, those who pray salah in khushu, will not just be granted, but the word is inherit, the word is waris here. And just not jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in this verse that they will inherit jannah al firdaus, the highest of jannah, subhanAllah. And Allah says, closes to this ayat, He says, hum fina khalidun. Khalas, they will abide there in forever. They will never come down. Subhanallah. Just for khushu in salah. Brothers and sisters, if you have memorized this sheet that, I, that we have given you, you have now known 20% of the Quran. 20% of the Quran. 
The Quran has 78,000 words. 7,000 words come in Surah Fatiha alone. 10% of the entire Quran comes in Surah Fatiha. The remaining 10% is what we have words in the sheet. And inshallah, the remaining 80% when we start our Quran program again from next week, inshallah. With that, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika astaghfiruka wa atubu wa ilik. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah blesses us with this, uh, yani, with the understanding of this class. قل الحمد لله وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى الله خير أما يشركون